Hi folks, welcome back. Thank you for watching. Please do hit subscribe if you haven't done so yet. It does make a big, big difference when you do that. So today folks, welcome to another Ask Perky video, which is where I answer your questions. And in an old Ask Perky video, I spoke about my biggest pedal buying mistake, which was the old Boss OD1 that I thought had a 14 pin chip in it. Turned out it had an eight pin, so I somewhat overpaid for it. And underneath that video, Dominic Hash, Dominic Hack, sorry, I think I've completely butchered your name there, Dominic, commented saying, what if you do a video about your biggest pedal bargains? So I thought that was a really interesting concept for a video, but instead of limiting it to just pedals, I thought today I would give you what I consider to be my biggest bargain when it comes to one pedal, one amplifier, one set of pickups, and one overall guitar. Now, I'm not gonna go into specifics of exactly what I paid for these things because I don't think that's really necessary and to be honest, talking about money is a bit vulgar. So I'm just gonna talk about the basic premise of why I think these purchases have been really, really good ones. So for the pedal then, I think my biggest bargain has to be this one here, an original 80s Boss VB2 Vibrato. Now, when it comes to vintage pedals, it's kind of easy to say any vintage pedal is a bargain because what generally happens is vintage pedals break over time. They're not original anymore, their value goes down. So the demand's still there while the supply is going down. So the price keeps going up of vintage pedals. So if you buy a vintage pedal, leave it a few years, it's generally worth a lot more than you paid for it. So you can kind of say any vintage pedal is a bargain when compared to its current market rate. But I always want one of these pedals. I love vibrato as an effect. It took me a long time to get it. I just kind of got sort of bogged down with the seasick type thing. But used subtly, I think it could be absolutely amazing. But I'm kind of alone in that in a way because vibrato has never been the most popular modulation effect, even back in the 80s. So there weren't many of these pedals made originally. So over time, they've become very collectible. And until a few years ago, the price was absolutely through the roof. You could pay many hundreds of pounds for one of these. But what happened then was Boss announced the VB2 was a craft. So all of a sudden, people still wanted these originals, but there was a very readily, readily available, much cheaper version knocking about that would give you 98% of the sound of one of these. So the price of these original units fell through the floor. So I, as soon as that happened, I jumped on this pedal because I'd always wanted an original and I absolutely love it. But then for whatever reason, people decided they wanted the originals again, so the price went back up. So I got in just at the right moment when the price was at its lowest for the you know, first time in decades. But what I absolutely love about this original VB2 is when it comes to most modulation pedals, your signal is split on the input and your one of them is kept completely clean. The other is modulated and then they're blended together. So that's what happens in a chorus pedal. Now, when you put a signal through a bucket brigade delay chip as pretty much all old analog modulation pedals are, you generally have to filter the high end off because there's a lot of noise in a BBD. So you kind of have to filter all the sort of the top end off um, to get rid of that noise. But it doesn't really matter too much because it's then blended with your nice, bright, defined clean sound and the two sit together. So the sort of the fidelity is still there from your clean sound and the warm throbby modulation comes from the BBD. But with a vibrato pedal, your entire signal is modulated. And so therefore your entire signal has to be filtered off up top to get rid of that clock noise. So generally speaking, vibrato pedals have a habit of sounding quite dark, but for whatever reason, the magicians at Boss made this one sound really bright, really defined and just absolutely perfect without too much noise. So I'm so glad I got on this pedal and uh, if it hadn't been for that sort of very brief crash in the market in terms of these originals, I would never have been able to own one, but I am so glad that I do. So, amplifier then. 
Now, I've got a few amps sat in front of me here that I use for my demos and my home recording, and they are all kind of pretty high-end, boutique, point-to-point, hand-wired amps, and I think that's really important when it comes to getting the most kind of clear, defined sound out of your guitar, which is what I'm all about when it comes to my own recording at least. I love bright guitars, I love definition, I love clarity, and I love kind of signal integrity. So I think hand wiring and point to point is really important for that. Now for the longest time I had my Hughes and Kettner Pure Tone and my Cornell Romany Plus. So it was an EL34 amp and a 6L6. And I wanted a kind of EL84 amp to sit in the middle to kind of complete the trio as it were. So in the end, I bought the Dr. Z DB4, which is an amazing sounding amp, but it's not what you would typically associate with the EL84 sound. It's not sort of super bright and chimey and bell-like, like a sort of Fox AC type amp. And after a lot of searching around, I realized that kind of the Dr. Z amp I should have gone for really was the Z Rec, which was Z's take on a sort of Vox AC type amp that he did with Ken Fisher, who made the old train wreck amps. And the, the problem with that though was the, I, I buy pretty much all of my stuff second hand but I'd never seen a Z-Rec come up second hand because I think people buy them and just cling on to them like a barnacle because no one wants to let them go because they're that good. So I looked around for ages and none had ever come up, but then eventually this uh, nice blue Z-Rec combo came up for sale. And I got it and as soon as it came here and I plugged it and turned it up, it was like a light bulb moment. I've always been kind of on the fence about Vox AC amps. Sometimes I play them and I absolutely love them and other times, especially when I crank them up, they're a bit dark and honky and middly and I'm a bit on the fence over them. But this Z-Rec is just astonishing. It is bright, it is clear, it's defined, it's got a load of low end if you want it to. The Celestian Alnico Gold in it is a perfect pairing for that circuit and it is everything you could possibly want from an EL84 amplifier. It's really touch sensitive, and generally when you watch one of my demos on this channel, it is the Z-Rec paired with another amp. It's kind of taken over as my number one, especially when it comes to demos. It is that good. <laughs> Now, at the start of this year, I got hold of this guitar here, which I wanted a Gibson ES guitar for ages. And I'd always kind of assumed I was gonna get a 335. But then this cropped up secondhand and I just fell in love with it. And it is an amazing guitar. It's completely hollow, so it does like to feedback, but because of that, it's really alive sounding. And any sort of you know frustrations you might have with the feedback are completely negated by how good this thing sounds. It's the perfect rec recording guitar. It's so rich in harmonics. It's just amazing. But one problem I did kind of start to have with it was I went on YouTube and I found one particular video which was Barry Cadogan from Primal Scream. And he has an original, I think it's a 62, 330. And compared to the sound of mine, Mine sounded quite dark and muddy. His had a real brightness and clarity and immediacy to it that mine was just lacking. So I put some VI pots in and some Lux Bumblebee capacitors, the original like, like paper and oil ones, which did help. But ultimately I wanted to change out the pickups. So I was looking around at various kind of boutique hand winders and trying to decide on the right ones. And then these came up on eBay. Now these are OX4 P90s. And at the time I'd never played any OX4 pickups. I'd heard so much about Mark's work, but I'd never played a set for myself. 
and these cropped up at much less than half of what they would be new and they'd basically never been played they were still in the original box i think they still had the um the plastic you know peel on it like they've just never really been used and they were going for like less than half so i jumped on them i put them in this guitar and they are just outstanding they revolutionize this guitar it now sounds right to my ears they are bright and bitey but with a weight to them they have a sort of jazzy warmth to them especially in this guitar and they are just astonishing now i've since got hold of a set of marks um low wind alnico 4 path replicas which i've got in my sg and they are amazing as well so i really want to check out some more of mark's um pickups in the future but yeah these p90s especially considering what i paid for them are just my biggest pickup bargain <laughs> guitar bargain. Now, as most of you will know from watching this channel, I am firmly in the kind of vintage guitar camp. Strats, Tellys, Les Pauls, Gibson ES guitars. Like That's kind of where I live. Modern sort of, you know, high output guitars are not my bag at all. So I generally stick with what I know, which is like the old shapes of the 50s and 60s. But I found a guitar listed on a guitar shop's website here in the UK a couple of years ago. And it just caught my eye because it looked very different from what, you know, from any of those classic shapes. But in my opinion, it didn't look weird. It wasn't like, it was like a shape I knew even though I didn't. It was basically this guitar here. This is my Gronland R16 Redeemer Junior. And this cropped up and I just saw it and thought, it just looks really cool. Now the previous owner or the, the um, guitar shop had polished up this metal scratch plate. It's since kind of tarnished and you know you can see where my fingers have been, which I love. But it's in really, really good condition. And it was going for what I thought was a really good price. And especially when I dived into these guitars and found out what they were all about, they are all hand built one at a time in Maine and the States by one chap called James Green. And there are no CNC machines used anywhere. The body is hand carved and shaped. The neck is contoured by hand. You know, everything is completely like artisan boutique. And especially with the additional optional extras like this Esquire switch and the Schroeder wraparound bridge, I worked out what this guitar would have cost the original owner, which compared to other handmade like one-off boutique guitars was still very reasonable, but it was way at, well out of my price range. And what the guitar shop were asking for it was really good, especially considering the original owner would have had to commission this guitar, spec it up with extras, get it shipped over from the States to the UK, paid import duty, paid um, like tax in the UK on it, and a hard case as well. And with all those extras, like the, the, the figure compared to what the shop was asking for it was really good. It was like, oh, okay. So I, wa I was kind of looking at this guitar for probably a couple of months and like oh, wanting to buy it and just couldn't quite afford it. And, and then the guitar shop obviously couldn't sell it. So they dropped the price by a good amount. And I just had to get it. And I'm so glad I did because it's an amazing sounding guitar. It's a black walnut body with a bird's eye maple neck. Um, I've changed the pickup in it. It did have a Porter Portatron. This is now a TV Jones Full Fidelity Filtertron, which is amazing. I've disconnected the Esquire switch because I wasn't really using it. Um, so it's now wired like a Les Paul Jr. But it is just an astonishing sounding guitar, which considering it would have cost the original owner several thousands of pounds when he had it commissioned, I got it for, you know, down in the hundreds not thousands so significantly down to the hundreds actually so 
I'm so happy I got this guitar. I am never letting it go. And I absolutely love this thing. And it sounds amazing as well. You know, you'd think it'd be limiting with just one pickup, but it really isn't. It's a chime machine. It sounds quite Gretsch-like, especially with this TV Jones pickup in there. But you know, I'm just record I'm recording stuff at the moment. I just can't stop using this guitar because it just sounds so good. So this is definitely my biggest guitar bargain. <laughs> folks my biggest bargains when it comes to gear so please do comment underneath guys let me know your bargains which pedals have you got on the cheap that you really like do you own a particularly special guitar that you're very happy with i love chatting about nerdy guitar stuff with you guys in the comments so please uh, do um stop by the comments and let's have a chat and also if you have any more ask perky questions drop them down there too and if i can make one of these videos answering your question i absolutely will do so so thank you for watching folks please do carry on subscribing if you haven't done so yet it really does make a big difference when you do that and i will see you next time bye bye